And now, a presentation on the Mental Health News Radio Network. The Outer Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. Ryan, that is a freaking awesome question. Yeah, great question. You are the power. And you do not need anybody's permission. Great question. You're, you're a great interviewer. You're one of the best. That is literally a brilliant question. If this is the best God can do, I am not impressed. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Outer Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. OuterLimitsRadio.com. I'm your host, Ryan. So, do you know what happens after we die? Well, according to Lifetime TV Networks, you have another piece of chocolate, oh, and it tastes so good, and you die. Oh. I can't believe I watch Lifetime TV networks. I'm a guy, I should be watching sports and going, yeah! No, I don't know. I guess I was hitting the head when I was a kid. But our featured guest is going to give us some definitive answers, because apparently our featured guest can traverse various dimensions, and we're going to get through that complaint department for God and figure out why things are all screwed up on Earth, so... Really excited about our future guest. Before we begin tonight's program, I have to bring to your attention that we've taken down the show on Howard Stern. That was the one that featured 10 experts. And the reason why is because the person I thought we were doing a show on and the person I've come to the realization who Howard Stern is are two different people. The person I was doing a show on was a person on Howard Stern that was very authentic And I don't think Howard Stern is authentic at all, at least not anymore. And I don't like the way he's been coming down on his core fans, kind of like feeling that he's above them and not relating to them. I I can't resonate with that at all because I love talking to you. I love talking to our listeners. I feel more comfortable talking to our listeners than I do most people. And I relate to our listeners because you're awesome. And you always write to me, you send me ideas, and we collaborate, and it's fantastic. And I don't feel that Howard Stern does anything like that at all. And I feel Stern is also part of the establishment right now, the same establishment that wants to suppress us. And I don't know. It's just also a bad energy feeling, too. And I I actually didn't know about this until after the show had aired. So it's kind of weird how the whole thing happened. But I'll always admire and respect him for what he did in radio. I admire his talents at the time. But I don't, uh, don't like him for what he's doing right now and where his trajectory is. So... I respectfully part ways with Stern from the energy, and he's no longer going to be featured or mentioned on our program. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. All right, so we got that off the plate. Now, let's get back in the saddle and start exploring multidimensional realities with our featured guest. Joining us now is Guy Stephen Needler. He is an author and pioneer in spiritual physics He's also author of several books, The History of God, Beyond the Source, Book 1 and 2, Avoiding Karma, Cosmos, and the Curators. And you can learn more about Mr. Needler by going to his website at beyondthesource.org. Mr. Needler, it is a great honor to have you with us today, sir. Well, thank you, Ryan, for inviting me onto your show. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be on, 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 on radio and um, to be able to share the information I've gathered through my work um, with yourself and uh, with, uh, with your listeners as well. Excellent. Well, I want to tell you that three people separately said that we should have you on the show. And one of them said, look, Mr. Needler has incredible insights. And also, if you look at his mustache for a longer period of time, your vibrational frequency will increase. He's got a very <laughs> celestial type mustache. So, I don't know how true that is. but that, uh, <laughs> yeah, Absolutely true. I've looked at it, and next thing you know, all these peaceful, wonderful things are manifesting around me. So, Mr. Needler, thank you to you and your mustache, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so one of your books, The History of God, seems to really resonate very deeply with people. What is your perspective on God? How do you perceive God, and how should human beings perceive God compared to a way a majority of them are currently perceiving God? Um, well, well, the problem with the word God is it's got a lot of religious uh, connotations and there's a lot of friction between different religious houses as a result of that so so really the word God is not the right word I, I don't believe it because, because it can also be attributed to um, 
lower entities as, as well. My understanding of God is that he, it's it's a it's an energetic uh, entity that is part of um, a much bigger entity that's called the origin, and and see, it's simply just sentient energy. Um, the thing is that <laughs> it's been uh, created or individualized from a this larger body of sentient energy called the, called the origin, which is growing in size and stature and, and, and evolution, um, to help it evolve as well. Now, the what, what, what we call God, or what I call source, or the source entity, um, is basically this sentient energy that's, that's been individualized from this larger entity called the, called the origin, and we are subsequently smaller individualized sentient energy from our source as well. So we're actually... We're actually smaller units of, of our creator, our source, or our God as well. And so it's like basically sentient energy or sentience working with a group of energies that to, to create a, a focus for that sentience to be able to experience, learn, and evolve, and we're part of that. When it comes to, are you saying that we are, are we one and the same with source, or are we separate? In source. Well, well, we're individualized within source. So, if, if within the history of God, there's a little bit of the history of how um, the source became what it is, and how, and, and our, how, it, how our environments became. I'm really curious is. about that. Yeah, <laughs> what's the origin yeah. of source? Yeah. So, so, it, so basically, to enable our creator, our source, to experience, learn, and evolve, it divided itself into two aspects. <clears throat> One, all within the same sort of area or, or volume of, of sentient space, it's kept half of itself to do what it wanted to do itself and then kept another half of itself which is separated out into uh, an environment, a, a multiversal environment which uses, um, let's say, one, two, three, four aspects of structure of itself. Okay, and then four, it occupies those four that, um, that, that, structures be? Yeah, those, it, its frequency... Uh, sub-dimensions, full dimensions, and, and zones. But the multiverse is just uh, frequency, sub-dimensions, uh, and, and full dimensions. There's, there's, many, there's much more structure above that. There's 12 levels of structure above that, and then it goes even higher. But that's, that's, but that's within the origin. But what it did, it created um, a, 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 a you know, billions of smaller units of itself to occupy this, this environment that it's separated out, to allow those small units to investigate, to experience, learn, and evolve, both itself and its structure, <coughs> excuse me, in a, a detailed and complete way, in a way that it can't do being much larger. It's a bit like us trying to understand what's in between the, uh, the pile of our carpet, for instance, or what's... what's moving around in between the hairs on our arm. We need to have an electron microscope. Um, and we can't interact with, with those things that, that are at, at a, a nano level. But if you create something that can interact with something that's at, at a nano level, you get proper interaction, you get proper understanding. Whereas if you're, if you're staying at a much higher level, a much larger level, you can't get down to that size. You can't experience the the absolute minute detail of, what, of what, who and what you are. So that's what the synth source has done. It's created smaller units of itself, which are effectively us. Uh, <clears throat> or should I say, our higher selves are effectively the things that were created. Our higher selves created smaller units of itself to, to, to do the work, which is, what, which is what we are, to experience, learn, and evolve the absolute minute detail of that which is this environment that the origin created to um, allow it through us to experience the minute, the minute detail and learn as well. Okay. Now, you say the source divided itself into two different parts. It's got maybe one part, I guess, that would be, let's say, hypothetically speaking, would be considered source itself, the totality of all things, you know, the highest point of evolution, I guess you want to call it that, and then you've got this other part that's broken up into all these different other billions or trillions or zillions of different parts that are kind of have this illusion of separation and they're kind of growing and evolving. Does source do this for the experience of rediscovering and revisiting um, the experiences for which allowed it to get to the original point it is now, which is source, 
is it doing this as a way of re-experiencing that, or is it doing this as a means of saying that it has not reached its total optimal evolutionary level within the physical dimensions? If you're looking at eternity, it, maybe it's there, but in the physical dimensions, maybe it hasn't gotten there yet. Um, well, it hasn't. It's it hasn't got there in the physical um, dimension, which is the first full dimension. But it certainly, it certainly hasn't got it achieved it in the other dimensions, which really? are the, the, the yeah. So, so when when it's when every smaller aspect um, that has experienced, learned, and evolved and progressed through as a function of evolution, all of the frequencies uh, that are available in the dimensions associated with the multiverse and they've, and they've all mastered things like incarnation and experienced everything that can be experienced in these different universes universal environments that are, that are available at these frequencies then they all re-commune with source and then source then regathers its sentience moves it away from the the energies that it's, that it's using to experience learn and evolve and then redistributes that sentience to more other energies, um, and then starts it again. So, the, in essence, <clears throat> an evolutionary cycle is the complete understanding of the energies within which it has associated its sentience with, with the use of smaller units of itself. Okay. And when it comes to that understanding, I bring to your attention that, I guess, from right now, as to this present moment, or the illusion of the present moment, I believe that I am occupying a physical body as a human experiencing consciousness through the eyes of a human being. Now, in that human mentality and that human consciousness, is it something that Source wants me to do? Is the Source want me to shift my perspective to know what it's like to be human yet have that human consciousness transferred to what it's like to be a bird? Or what it's like to be multidimensional by um, you know through deep meditation. Why? Um, what is the real purpose of human? Is it should, if as if you are a human, should you stay in human consciousness, or should you try to evolve and spread out your frequency and have a different perspective beyond human? Or are you basically <coughs> doing a disservice to your evolution for which you are mm. here for? Yeah, um, the whole point of being in the human body and other uh, incarnate vehicles that are available to us within the within the, the gross physical and the higher frequencies within, within the physical universe is to experience the lowest frequencies associated with the multiverse. It would be inappropriate for us to experience only the higher frequencies of the multiverse because we, we, would, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't gain a, a, the best level of experience and therefore understanding of the total multiversal picture, so to speak, as part of that which is our source. So, so our reason to be here is to experience this universe in the way it should be experienced, which is to experience things like resistance, things like um, inability to communicate because the frequencies are so low, so we, 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 we lose pretty much most of the coherent contact with our true energetic, our, our energetic selves, which is our higher self, that, that much bigger part of us which remains disincarnate. And so it's all about, so being in the human form and other forms is about experiencing the environment in the way that the environment presents itself. If we experienced it in our higher frequency condition, we wouldn't be experiencing things like hardships, joy, love, desperation, um, physical tension, physical disability, physical ability, and all these different things. So it's, it's really about you know, understanding and experiencing everything. Now, when we go underwater, we to experience being underwater properly and perpetuate our existence, we have to put a diving suit on. And so if you think of the human body and other vehicles that are similar within different, within different frequencies or the same frequency that we're in now, it's just like a, it's just like a diving suit. It's allowing the, the smaller aspect of our higher self or true energetic self, what we call the soul, to experience that environment in a complete and coherent and robust and repeatable way through the use of a vehicle which is developed to work in that, that environment and allow us to move around and interact with each other and interact with the environment and create within the environment. And as far as these things you describe, pain, suffering, desperation, are these experiences only available 
in the human form or in an Earth-like planet, because we are in a physical universe, do these same experiences apply to other life forms throughout our particular universe? And if so, how are these experiences magnified or demagnified in terms of the evolution level of the civilization on any particular planet within our universe? Yeah. Uh, well, in essence, the Earth is a, is a bit of an experiment. It's, it's the only planet where we have individualized free will. And so we're really? totally... Yeah. I don't feel we like are, we have free will. But I'm, <laughs> we I'm individualized, open Yeah, we have individualized free will while we're here. Uh, we have a plan, a life plan, but that's just a series of goals. I mean, how we achieve those goals is up to us. We're a bit like a, we're a, bit like a mouse or a rat in a maze. The, the objective being, or well, the goal being to get to the middle, of the, the middle of the maze to get the food. The second goal is to get out again. So, so it's, a little bit, it's a little bit like that in so much as we, we have a series of goals we have to achieve, but, and our individualized free will allows us to achieve those goals in whichever way we want to, or can. Um, now, in terms of the, 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 these, these experiences, whether it's um, emotional, um, empathic, you know, things like the joy, love, <clears throat> despair, worry, pain, uh, suffering, etc., um, uh, eureka moments, all these different things, they're experienced by other incarnate beings as well. But they tend to experience in a different way because most of these beings are working in a collective function. And that means they all work together for the benefit of the whole rather than the benefit of the individual. So even though in, in, the, in the best case some of them have individualized free will, that individualized free will is also is still tied into the need to <coughs> consider the collective that they're working with. So if they do something or they choose to do something, they have to consider whether what they're doing is going to be positive or negative, you know, de detrimental or beneficial to the, the rest of those in, in individuals that they are part of in terms of this incarnate civilization. So the, the, the other case is that the, the top of um, communion-based or collective-based situation is a bit like our hive mind where the whole mind is um, within all of the, the different incarnate um, vehicles, for instance, and they... They all work collectively for the whole rather than one working for itself. Okay. So do you think that because this is a planet where what it appears that most people are working on an individual level, then I could feel be unified? Do you think that more other civilizations, maybe most of the civilizations in the universe, are working on that collective high mentality where they're kind of thinking as themselves as one species? Yeah. <clears throat> um, there's, a, there's a vast majority are working in, in the sort of, the, I would say, a more intelligent hive level, but there's an awful lot that are also working in a uh, sort of a pseudo free will, uh, individualized free will, where they, they do have to work uh, with the consideration of how it affects the, the, the majority. They can still work on, on, you know, work on themselves and work for themselves, but, that, but they have to sort of think, well, how does working for myself help the rest of society, so to speak, or civilization? And and in working for myself, are, are they benefiting, or 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 not the case maybe? But from what I'm picking up, it's a, there's about it's about 50 percentish, maybe 60 percent of those incarnate civilizations operate in a collective function. The rest of them operate in in looser versions, but none of them have this total individualized free will, where we're where we're only responsible to ourselves, and if we want to. We, we, we abide with common laws of, of existence. Okay, when it comes to free will, I know a lot of people say that we have free will on this planet, free will, but I, I just see that the, um, the tyrannical governments and people out there, they're trying to just pull people in, into one collective thought pattern. This censorship's getting really intense right now, and I don't even think that the censorship or pulling people into this collective is even benefiting the individual. I always feel it's benefiting the, the top people that really run everything. But what I want, want to ask you this is, say, for example, you, you go on the highway, you're driving your car, you get off on an exit, and you're like, wait a second, this is a bad neighborhood. I'm going to get back on the highway and go travel to another destination. So, I don't know. I feel like some of us got here, got off on the wrong exit. We got off the wrong stop because this place is maybe a little bit more intense or a lot more intense than we expected it to be. Can we do anything at the present moment? 
to magnify our chances of going to another uh, place of existence? Can we foster enough energy and strength to move our loved ones to another reality where there's a lot more peace and there's a lot more respect and there's a lot more intelligence? Because I think sometimes if you're intelligent and you have a lot of love in your heart and you have a lot of peace in your heart, you're basically a nonconformist in this reality. Yeah, I mean, we, the, the the thing is that um, everything is is because we behave in individualized free will. We are responsible for ourselves, and ultimately, our family members are responsible for themselves as well. So we can create the opportunity if we're more enlightened to show them the way. <coughs> and in some instances, we try to tell them the way, which is usually fails because it's because people want to find their own their own way rather than be told which way to go. But if we if we create the opportunity for showing by example rather than by rote which way to go and, and what to do to create the new reality around ourselves and, and raise our frequencies so that we do move into the next frequency level and out of this particular low one, then basically we 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 by default and by our own actions offer those individuals the chance to follow us should they decide to do so now it's 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 very it's very common that you have a family member who's thinking in a high frequency way and then the rest of the family are sort of normal and another one within the family is completely low frequency in terms of their thoughts behaviors and actions and so and then uh, just before I got, became 40 um I was introduced to Reiki and then um, I was then introduced to Brennan Healing Science and somebody else who was also uh, a friend of mine who was also interested in Reiki um, was told by another friend of theirs that I needed to go to see them in Sweden and then I went over to Sweden and I ended up with a, uh, a profound awakening that, that's happened there uh, I, I was in essence we went on a countryside walk down the river and um, I got the feeling I needed to sit down and meditate. And, and as I did that, I got the feeling that the, the area around me became sort of a, a frequential portal or something. And I, I noticed there was various, I perceived there was various crafts hovering above me and they were rewiring me. And um, my, my late wife and my friend who were watching me, they both said that they, they saw, they perceived these crafts as well. This, this was all before, we didn't sort of, we wrote these things down separately, so we didn't confer with each other. So we used, we used sort of uh, no knowledge as a control, no, no knowledge of what each other had experienced as a control, and we'd all got the same thing. So that was amazing, that was. And then my healing work started to change its direction. Um, the, the lady who was teaching me uh, the healing work, the Brennan-based healing work, um, t taught us how to channel to find information out about the patient so we could uh, get a better level of healing uh, and use the right modalities for healing for, for, for the patients. And it was during the, the, this, this channeling that I started to do more and more meditation again and I started to access various different frequency levels and various different entities and eventually got in contact with Source um, and it created the origin. And Basically, basically, the rest of it is, is clairsentience, really. It's, 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 bully, it's going to these different frequency levels, communicating with these entities, bringing the information back, and also knowing the information as well, and, and not having to, eventually, not having to go through the very detailed <laughs> meditative work to get to these levels. To so how, how are you doing it? Was it um, does it have to do with your brainwave frequencies? No, what I, what I did is I, I meditated and then created a a visualization technique where I was moving up a series of stairs and lifts and all sorts of manner of different ways of moving upwards at the frequencies. And it was initially really laborious, I mean seriously laborious. It took me three quarters of an hour to move up to a, a couple of three frequencies and then three quarters of an hour to come back down again. <laughs> um, so it took a long time, and, but, but now these days I can just go there. But it, it, it was the interaction with these entities and interaction with higher levels of consciousness that gave me the opportunity to start writing this stuff down. I was given um, a gift of retent retentive memory in a, a really detailed way for the work I was doing. 
And so I would meditate in the morning before work, and in lunchtime I could have complete download, and I could type it up at lunch, in my lunch break. And then eventually I, I looked at all these, these different meditative uh, notes and thought, well, uh, well, hang about, this, this could be interesting. I don't, I'm not seeing anything like this in, in the rest of the metaphysical um, world, so to speak, so this could be a good book. <laughs> so the next bunch of years, uh, oh, I guess the next sort of seven or eight years, I, I, I continued to do the meditation work. I continued to write it down. I continued to collate it and, and, and correlate it. And I eventually ended up with the manuscript that was the history, that was the history of God. And I sent that out to a bunch of publishers. Um, it was initially published at first by a self-publishing uh, publishing house, um, but not not the full book that you see now. Um, literally seven months later, I had a contract with Ozark, who was Dolores Cannon's publishing house, and um, I then presented to her a sequel, which she said, "No, you've got to put this all in the same book." So that's why the history of God is the, the biggest book so far. Although my the book I'm work I've just finished and they're they're reviewing, the curators might be the same size. <laughs> oh. I think it's really interesting that you have these meditative thoughts and you're starting these downloads. Now these downloads do you know where they're coming from? Are you getting information that is somehow tarnished I wouldn't say it tarnished, but basically skewed towards whatever belief patterns you currently had? At the time, so say for example, you were passionate about, uh, you had a couple of interests that you were very passionate about. Did you get information that was geared towards your interest as a human being? Or was this information just pure information? You don't know where it's coming from, you're just writing it down as it filters out. Well, I, I, I knew where it was coming from because I was in, con- I was in communication with uh, various different entities who I could identify with, uh, which included the source and the origin, um, and go back to and go back to communicate with them. And so I, I had a, a robust uh, and repeatable communicative method where I could go back to the same entities and continue discussion on a, on a certain subject matter. Um, but sometimes, I don't, well, these days I don't need to, do, to communicate with an entity. I can just go into the, the multiverse, if you want to, and just get the information, basically. And so... But what I do is I do I check I make sure that the information is coming through is pure, and I do that by looking at the the words that are being used, the sentences that are being used, how these how they're being conjugated, the knowledge that's there, and I look to see whether it's something I could have picked up myself, like reading books or watching television or or something else, um, or whether it's pure, it is completely new outside of my previous experience. And there's also coming from somewhere else other than my subconscious, for instance. So I have to check everything all the time. That's awesome. You're able to check in different universes. That's pretty well. And when you're checking these universes, one of the – I'm asking you about this because I, I remember reading something on your site about how to avoid karma. Because I, I want to avoid it. I don't feel I should be swept up in this in the karma of America because I don't believe in a lot of things that my, my fellow citizens do. And I, I think that there's a lot of things that – people get swept up in that maybe they shouldn't be swept up in. So what do you foresee happening in the future of America, at least in the sh- short term, like the next three or four years? Or, and let's say, for example, the world. Do you see any large events happening? Well, um, right now, we're in a bit of confusion, <laughs> as you can observe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we've, in essence, we've, give, we've allowed ourselves the... Um, the luxury of having total individual free will and not, and not being worried about what happens as a result of that. And that includes our ability to um, elect certain leaders. That, that, that's not just leaders within the UK or, 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 or within the US, but it's worldwide. Uh, and it's also lower down as well, for instance, leaders in uh, organizations, clubs, businesses, all of these different things. And we've, and we've basically taken our off the ball, and as a result of that, we've lost control. And what's this is? And this is all the cumulative effect of the way we were thinking back in the late '60s. You know, the flower power era of not being conformist, um, to, you know, returning on, tuning in, dropping out, 
although the turning on and tuning in is more of a, a mental thing now rather than a, an actual thing. It's sort of working where we want to within different environments, but only if we want to and not because we need to or have to. And so we, what we've done is we've done this, and now we're starting to realize that actually we do need to have some sort of order. And, and what will happen is that there will be a little bit of a, I'm not going to say a rebellion, but there will be a, a number of individuals who will start to work in a way which is more consistent with order and coherent as a result of that and logical and not just random or or ridiculous. And, and so what we'll start to do is we'll start to think about working collectively rather than singly or individually because we, we will have seen what pure individualism can create and it creates disorder basically which you can argue is order in its own right anyway but, uh, but, but we'll start to work more, more collectively on behalf of each other because we'll see that when we let go of what we are we lose the ability to, to move upwards if we, if we can work together we can work for each other but, but consider others and be of service to ourselves and service to others at the same time, then we're going to start to move up the frequencies and things will start to become more visible to us in terms of how we, how we need to work together to, to progress and to evolve, not only as individuals but as an incarnate civilization. And we'll see the benefits of that. We will start to truly see and experience the benefits of that. And we'll, we will naturally elect to move in that direction. But that's going to happen, though, what I'm seeing here is the start of that's going to take about 10, 15 years. Mr. Neelay, I cannot thank you enough for saying that answer because I, now I've never been more sort of that I am on the wrong planet, that wherever I'm from, the people there pranked me by dropping me off on Earth. I mean, I guess they gave me a couple of consolation prizes by giving me, like, you know, allowing me to have an awesome wife and family. So I'm thankful for them. But when it comes to the individualism, I almost, uh, maybe if we're going to disagree, but I feel like when a person is at their best and they are expressing their true individualism, it is a, an expansion of whatever collective consciousness they are with. And if you have some basic rules, basic agreements saying, you know, peace and respect, peace and respect, I shall not harm, I shall not infringe upon another, yet you look within and you express all those talents, all those thoughts, all those dreams within. I'm wondering how is that not beneficial in the long term for that society? Because if you have people that are shutting down, that are becoming in that hive mentality, and they are not an expression of their infinite consciousness of what's truly within, how does that not? How does that culture not become bland and lose and not lose its ability to evolve, grow, and even address the current problems that it's having? I almost feel like the the loss of individualism is the death of evolution or the death of this civilization within the current confines that it is right now. Well, it's not so, it's not so much a loss of individualism. It, 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 the, the correct way to go is more a case of individualism that benefits the collective. And so, and so it's, it's, it's individually taking the opportunity to think about how we as individuals can work in a way which is not only benefiting ourselves, but benefits everybody else as well. And if it benefits everybody else in our locale or in our country or, or, or a city or, or a planet, for instance, then, it, could, then it, it helps us all to move upwards as, as, as a group rather than separately. So individually we can work on ourselves um, and provide an example through that individual work um, others can benefit from that, some of that work physically, but in doing so, everybody else learns, and they can see the benefits that, have, that, that, that are resolved from it. And you know, why wouldn't you want to participate? Why wouldn't you want to benefit in a similar way to to somebody else who's working in a, a good way, that's um, working on themselves, working on this environment, being a good example, and showing others how to be a good example, and others benefiting from the work, from the physical work and from the mental work as well. And you can see how people, see people, when people work on themselves, you can see them shining. <laughs> you can see how their life is not encumbered by 
the need to be this, the need to be that, the need, the need to have this, the need to have that. Oh, yeah, yeah I see the materialism. Totally but I also think that there are a lot of people out there that they're, I would call them at a frequency where maybe they have a low self-esteem where they feel that um, their feelings are more important than your feelings and their will be done. And anytime somebody who tries to infringe or push their patterns upon another individual and say that my belief patterns, they are they are king. They are, they are what rules. I can't stand that. I absolutely, I fight so hard against that because I feel it, 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 is, it is a travesty of evolution to to sit there and to be subservient to another's uh, you know needs or commands in that particular way. And that it is a um, is your duty to express the creativity, the beauty within. And shine that out, and hopefully it benefits other people. I mean, some people may not be able to see it, but I'm really curious. You know, you've had these conversations with Source, and I've read some of these conversations. It's pretty awesome. I mean, I can't even get certain people on the phone. You you get Source on the line, the creator <laughs> of all things. So congratulations. That's awesome. Uh, feel free to give out the number anytime you'd like, because I'm sure our listeners would like to get Source to call. What is the origin of Source? What was Source doing before? I mean, you said it broke up and half it's out in the physical universe. But what was Source before all this happened? Like, how did Source come about? Was is Source the son or daughter of another Source? Are there many Sources? Are there infinite Sources in addition to Source? All right. Well, there are a number of other Sources. Um, okay. but basically, they're all doing their own thing. And in the Beyond the Source books, identify in very high level what they what they are doing basically. Uh, to experience, learn, and evolve. But the, all of these different source entities are the creation of, an, of a much larger entity called the origin. Now, the Hindus, okay. uh, I, I found out later, after I've discovered this from my own work, call this, this entity the absolute, all there is. You know, they call it the absolute is the all that there is. And there's, there's only a few yogis who actually talk about that which is beyond God, so to speak, that which is beyond the source. And... Um, in essence, this, this origin, the origin, uh, the, 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 this entity, the sentient en- entity that created our, our, our source entity, um, came into being through natural evolution of energies, coalescing together, grouping together, seeking each other out, uh, gaining rudimentary intelligence, the intelligence wanting to find other energies of the same type, you know, and eventually everything comes together and you get, you get intelligence, high intelligence, consciousness, self-awareness, you know, all, and all these different things come out of it and eventually you get sentience. And it, decided, and it decided it needed to understand itself more. So it tried to recreate, eventually, uh, itself outside of this current area of, sen- of, of, of self-awareness, or probably on this sentient self-awareness. But that failed because if you don't know what you are properly, how can you create <laughs> something <laughs> which is the same as yourself? So... It had to reuse those energies, it had to sort of recycle them, and it created um, smaller entities within, within its um, area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness, but in areas with the, that it, it needed to work on itself. And it, it said, you, know, you, can, you can come into beingness in your own time, but as soon as you become self-aware, I will tell you what your role is. And that's, and that's what it did. And, and the... They said, you're, and basically it said that your role is to experience, learn, and evolve in any way you want to. How you do, it's up to you. But in evolving, you evolve, I evolve as well. So it's, so it's as, as you're smaller units of me anyway, we all benefit, basically. And, um, and so that's what's happened. <laughs> we, we are, yeah, we're, and there's sort of several levels of this, isn't there? There's the origin, there's the source, there's our true entity self or higher self or Godhead, which it all means the same thing. Those words. That's awesome. I, I love that we're go- I love that we're exploring beyond the source. And when it comes to the origin, the creator of source, I wonder how these energies were able to come together, coalesce together, if they are in a dimension or place where there is no time. To my understanding, is that in the physical universe we have the illusion of time, and the illusion of time is used to perpetuate the illusion of separation and the illusion of evolution in a physical form while not being in spirit. So when you, the origin, the creation of origin in spirit form in eternity, I'm wondering how that was able to happen without the factor of time. And also, it's another question, 
is that when you have people, uh, some people report that they have experiences with uh, beings that are not of this world that communicate through telepathy. And some other people have been able to uh, communicate through mental telepathy. So the thought transfers from one person to another person. That being said, if we are all manifestations and creations within the mind of source, can we, theoretically speaking, transfer ourselves out of this source creation that we are part of into another source that maybe manages the shop a little bit better because in the words of George Carlin, I wouldn't necessarily call the quote-unquote source or God this great being. I would call it a third great temp that's messing things around. I was wondering, can we, can we go for a transfer out of this source into a much more, I don't know, loving, compassionate, able-bodied source? <laughs> um, well, my understanding is that's difficult. Okay. <laughs> um, but it, it, I'm willing to it, take a chance. Let's do it. Yeah. It, it's it's rather unlo- it's, it's a bit like you being a, an atom within 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 your own body. Um, that atom stays within the body generally, and it, it, it's not it's the only way it would get out of the body is if, it is a, if you offered your blood as a blood transfusion, or you offered one of your one of your um, organs as, as a, as a, for a transplant opportunity, like, like a liver or a, or a kidney, for instance. But so basically, we tend to st- we tend to stay. Um, Almost um, <clears throat> all the time within our our creator's energy, within our creator's sentience, because we are part of that sentience. The only time that individuals could move out is if they're not actually belonging to that sentience. They were, and there, there are other beings um, that are or entities that aren't part of a particular source entity. They were. Uh, some of these things, some of the entities are a byproduct, <laughs> basically, of the reuse of energy. Um, and they, although they they sometimes associate themselves with the source, they're, they're not bound to stay within that sentient energy of that source, and they can move on to, to communicate with, with another source entity, for instance, or, or move around the energies that, that are essentially the, the origin as well. So basically, if, if ma- the vast majority of individuals within our source entity are, are bound to be within that, that energy as well. So the only thing we can do is is create a new reality around ourselves based upon what we want to experience. And that, helps, and that gives us the opportunity to change the environment and therefore, if you want to, change our God. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, that was very helpful information. And we've had some guests on the program that have talked about other beings within the universe that seem to be very advanced, that bend space and time in order to traverse trillions of light years to get to where we are. Mm. So being that advanced, if, a, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a creation within the source, is that advanced, have they already been doing this already? Have they, do you think that some uh, beings within source or imaginations within source have found a way to actually break out of source at this point in time? Has it, I'm just curious. Cause I wonder if it has been done before then I wonder if we would have the 100th monkey effect where we would have other beings throughout the universe do it. <laughs> yeah. My, my understanding is it's only entities that are called the OM who are part of the, who are actually individualized as a function of the reuse of energy that was the origin uh, in its first manifestation of smaller versions of itself. Um, and that energy was re- reabsorbed and, and then reused to create this, the source entities with, with, a, um, with a lower level of I'm not going to say authority, but lower level of um, ability, so to speak. Uh, and the, the, en- the energies that were, that were, that were, re- that were, re- that were, that were origin energy to create an origin, uh, to, to create other origins, was reused and didn't, didn't, didn't change into source entity energy. It didn't, didn't go down the pecking order, so to speak. It stayed separate in, in little bits and pieces. So these entities, they're, they're called the arm. Um, and there's various different versions of them depending upon how how much sentient energy was absorbed or wasn't absorbed, so to speak, by the by, by various different source entities. Um, sometimes can um, move in and out of a source, but in general, in general, if they're a hybrid source entity stroke or origin energy, they tend to sort of stay within a, within a source. So 
entities that are created by a source entity um, won't be able to escape those that 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 volume of sentient energy that, that, that is there created because because that sentient energy that, that, that is them is also their creator and their creator is them. Okay, Mr. Dealer, we just have time for two more questions. I'll ask you them both right now. First one is. I have to say that I have enjoyed talking with you. I think you are a cool dude. And question one is, would you consider having a uh, life with me next time? So the next life incarnation, I don't know if we, if we can agree to be buddies or maybe work together because I like your frequency. I think that we'd, we'd work really well together as uh, you know, maybe a bait tackle shop or running a pizza store or something like that. Because we, we definitely have some things to talk about. That's the first question. Well, I'd like, I'd, I'd like to think we'd be beyond having a pizza shop or a, or a fish and tackle shop. Sure. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, well, that that's awesome. Well, yeah, we show you. I don't know, doing something. Cause definitely want to be working with you. And the second question is, what is the most self-empowering piece of advice that you can offer a person right now piece of advice you can offer them to realize their true power within? The most important piece of advice I can give anybody is to realize that they can change their reality around them. We, 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 we don't exist in time, we exist in events, and it's event space, and event space can also parallel itself as well, so we get these different parallel conditions. But in essence, these events and these parallel spaces can also create realities. And, and we create our reality around us. So if you want to exist in a different reality, all you have to do is use your, in, your desire, your intention, your thoughts and your actions to create that which you want. We can, we can either live in hell or we can live in heaven. But one thing's for sure, we can create it ourselves. And all of us, all of us can communicate with Source because ultimately we are Source. Mr. Guy Stephen Needler, author and pioneer in, phys in spiritual physics. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. You can learn more about Mr. Needler by going to his website at beyondthesource.org. Then the books are The History of God, Beyond the Source, Book 1 and 2, Cosmos, the Curators. It was really great to have you on the program. Thank you for agreeing. Thank you. Have a lifetime with me the next time, and uh, we'd love to have you back on the show again in the future. Thank you very much. I'll be honored. Thank you very much, Ryan. I really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank all of the listeners for listening in as well. Okay, everyone. That concludes today's edition of the Out of Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. Special thanks to our fascinating guest, Mr. Guy Needler. Wow, we learned some cool info tonight. And special thanks, as always, to the Out of Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show virtues, Ms. Carrie O'Connor, Ms. Lisa Kaza, and Ms. Constance Dellis. To learn more about the Outer Limits of Inner Truth, please go to our website at OuterLimitsRadio.com. Until the next time we meet, my friends, I wish upon you an abundance of peace, love, and beers. Take good care, and thanks as always for listening.